program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with Eau Claire County. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. I call to order this regular meeting of the Eau Claire County Board of Supervisors on this Tuesday, March the 3rd, uh, 2020. Uh, supervisors, please rise for honoring the flag. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Supervisors, please take your seats for the moment of reflection. Supervisor Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we enter this early spring month of March, I'm prompted to reflect upon some past events and look forward to future events. It was on this day, March 3rd, in 1913, one day before the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson, that more than 5,000 women descended on Washington, demanding the right to vote. Some came on foot, some on horseback, some in wagons. There were costumes and placards and about a half a million spectators lined the streets. Among the marchers were journalist Nellie Bly, activist Helen Keller, and actress Margaret Vale, who was also the niece of the incoming president, who was by no means an ally of the suffrage movement. He once said women who spoke in public gave him a chilled, scandalized feeling. Despite being heckled and harassed by the crowd, the march was enormously memorable. Six years later, Congress passed the 19th Amendment extending the franchise to women nationwide. We marked the 100th anniversary on August 18th this year. The celebration has already begun in Wisconsin because we have the distinction of being the first state to ratify on June 20th, 1919. The journey leading to that point was decades long. Leaders like Alice Paul were arrested and imprisoned, subjected to deplorable conditions and beatings. When Paul began a hunger strike, guards deprived her of sleep, threatened to commit her into an insane asylum, and eventually force fed her by shoving tubes down her throat. It wasn't until 1987 that March was designated Women's History Month to celebrate the contributions of all those women and many others. With three more elections coming up this year, we should all honor the valiant efforts of those who came before us and exercise our right to vote. A few years ago, not far from where that famous march took place, I had the pleasure of meeting Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, only the third woman appointed to the High Court and the first Latina justice. At our gather gathering, she offered this advice. As you discover what strength you can draw from your community in the world from which it stands apart, look outward as well as inward. Build bridges instead of walls. Next week, as we engage with the community during our Speak Your Peace civic engagement sessions, we would be wise to follow her advice. We need to reach out in this civic engagement effort. Suffrage movements survive disagreements and factions. But as Alice Paul saw it, I always feel the movement is a sort of mosaic. Each of us puts in one little stone, and then you get a great mosaic at the end. Our strategic plan may indeed be like that mosaic, and two, it will have to work through some differences. Finally, let's embrace the words of that brave activist who marched in 1913, Helen Keller, who said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you. Tonight's meeting will be broadcast at Valley Media Works, Charter Channel 994, on Thursday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. following the meeting. WFRP, WFRP LP 101.9 FM and online at valleymediaworks.org. The next item on our agenda is the call of the roll. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and indicate your presence. Uh, 24 present. 25 present. We do have quorum. Good timing. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is approval of the Journal of Proceedings for February 19, 2020. Uh, motion. 
Supervisor Coffey, sorry, and second Supervisor Leary. I will do this by voice vote. Any additions, corrections, or deletions to the Journal of Proceedings? See none. All those in favor of approving the Journal of Proceedings, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. We have no public comment this evening, so we will move to item six, reports to the county board under 2.04.320 versus an oral report from Rachel Manning regard, regarding the U.S. Census Bureau. Rachel Manning. Oh. <laughs> you have to come up here and talk. <laughs> While we're waiting for the slides to populate, um, I'd like to just thank the chairman and all of the county board supervisors for inviting me here and adding me to your agenda tonight to talk with you about how we're preparing Oakbrook County for the 2020 census. So as I'm looking around the room, I can see many familiar faces and I'm glad to have had an opportunity to talk with many of you individually um, in your communities and here as I've been working throughout Oakbrook County. We tested this before this before we proceeded and it worked then. Okay, good. Um, my name is Rachel Manning. I'm a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau of Chicago Regional Census Center. I do not live in Chicago. I actually live here in Eau Claire County and I work in Eau Claire County. I also work in Jackson, Chippewa, Barron, Rusk, Washburn, St. Croix, Pierce, Price, so several other um, neighboring and surrounding counties. And through my job as a partnership specialist, I work prim primarily with local governments, um, city and county and town officials, village officials, to help prepare communities for the upcoming 2020 census. So um, I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk with you tonight about why it's important that we do, um, that we build partnerships with our local communities to think about how do we strategize our outreach, how do we educate and inform our residents about the census, how they participate, why their participation matters, why it's important. Um, so I'd like to briefly discuss some of those things with you tonight, and then also just give you a sense of what's been happening here in Eau Claire County and across your communities um, as we've been preparing, and as we've also probably been noticing some census work and activity happening. Um, so I'd like to kind of help you understand what's already been happening and then leave you with some ideas on, of what you can do to help um, educate and participate or encourage participation among your constituents and those um, within your communities as well. So I'd like to just start, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna wager a pretty good bet here that the majority of you already have a pretty good understanding of, of why we do a census. Um, but we conduct a census every 10 years because we have to. It's constitutionally mandated of us to do an entire nationwide population headcount every 10 years. Um, this 2020 census will mark the 24th time that our country has conducted a population headcount since 1790. Um, and our mutual goal every time we have a decennial census year is to count everyone, right? To make sure that we count everybody um, and that we count them in the right place. And there are a lot of unique and, and tricky living situations and challenges that um, that, that do create some challenges in, in counting the entire population. Um, so I'd like to talk about a couple of those things tonight um, and hopefully leave you with some ideas on how we can address those challenges and those barriers and make sure that we count everybody here in Eau Claire County. So every time we have a census year, we count everybody living in the United States, 
um, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and our island areas. We count everybody regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, citizenship status. Everybody counts in the census count. And as you can imagine, I'm sure many of you have used census data in, in your daily lives and in the work that you do, but we use this data in many different ways. It helps inform all different levels of government from funding decisions, policy making. Um, it's, it's unlikely that m many of you have not used census data in some way or another, and it really does truly impact all of us. But important reasons why we do a decennial census every 10 years are for reasons related to apportionment and funding. So every 10 years, the results of the census data um, allow us to reapportion seats in the U.S. House of Representatives so states can stand to gain or lose representation based on how their population has changed over time, over the last 10 years. We also use census data and the population counts every 10 years to help us determine how we allocate funding back to states, approximately $675 billion of federal funding um, that gets distributed to states on an annual basis for the next 10 years. And that is largely determined by how many people live in our state. So funding that comes back to our state and flows back to our local communities is really impacted by how many people live here. So it's important that we get our counts right and that we don't miss people. I like to talk a little bit about um, a project that I think is really interesting called the Counting for Dollars 2020 project, which is a study that comes out of um, George Washington University. And it looks at how the decennial census data is used to actually distribute that funding to states. The un other interesting report that comes out of this study is looking at the potential fiscal impacts to states if you, we were to experience an undercount. Um, so for example, and what's nice about this project is that it provides a, su a funding summary for each state. And I think this is important because it really helps us understand and see what we potentially gain, what we what we potentially risk um, or miss out on when we miss people. Every person that we miss potentially costs us um, approximately thirteen hundred dollars per capita per fiscal year when we miss people in the count. Um, so if you think about a one percent undercount of our state, and we and we estimate our our population, and we know that when we miss people, we miss out on thirteen hundred dollars over 10 years, over a year's time and over a 10 year period of time, we're missing out potentially on tens of billions of dollars that is not coming back to our state and is not coming back to our local communities for really important um, services and programs that residents here really rely on. Um, and, and importantly, for improved quality of life and, and to enhance our communities. That study is available for um, people to look at if you're interested at the Counting for Dollars 2020 project. So as you think about why it matters, why does it matter that we count people? Why does it matter that we tell people that we want them to participate and do outreach? Um, this is why, because we want um, our fair share of that funding pie, um, and we also want to be fairly and equally represented in Congress. So. In order to do this, um, we have been working through our local governments and local communities to convene what we call complete count committees. So this is the vehicle that we use at the local level to help us think about what are the challenges to participating in the census? What are the barriers that people face? Why might someone not want to participate in the census or respond or provide their household information? So the complete count committee is formed to do that. Um, their charge is to think about how do we educate, engage, and encourage people to participate. Um, so fortunately, in Eau Claire County, we have convened a joint city-county complete count committee um, that is comprised of several different representatives from both city and county officials. And, and not only have we engaged this committee to help us strategize how we do outreach, um, anticipate barriers to participating or to responding, um, but they're helping us engage even more local partners. So there's a long list of the partnerships that we've started to build um, and are nurturing now to help us educate um, and encourage those that they work with um, within the communities that they live in and that they work in. And I would never be able to recite for you the long list of partnerships that we've um, started to build, but I did want to at least be able to share with you 
um, a list of those who have been involved in the city county um, complete count committee. So we have city and county officials um, from both the planning and housing authority divisions of, of the city and county government. We have representatives from the Ellie Phillips Senior Center and Public Library. We have representation from the Hmong Mutual Assistance Agency, Power of Eau Claire, the Black and Brown Women Power Coalition, um, from the Jonah Organization, joining our neighbors Advancing Hope. We have representatives from other town and um, villages and other municipalities, for example, the city of Altoona, the town of Pleasant Valley, and the town of Union. Um, so I just wanted you to understand and know that there's been a really robust effort here in Eau Claire County to think about making sure that we have a comprehensive outreach plan and strategy that reaches all of our Eau Claire County communities. I'm not gonna talk through all of the census operations, but I wanted to at least show this so and, and illustrate what the census operation really looks like. So we conduct this operation in, a, in, in five separate phases. Um, we started with our initial phase of establishing where we count. Um, this is where we have um, Census Bureau employees called um, address canvassers go out in communities and help us verify where all of the housing units are. We need to know where people live so that we know where to count them. We um, wrapped up that part of the operation in August and we moved on to our next phase, which is where we are motivating people to respond. So we're forming up our complete count committees, we're building partnerships, we're educating, we're putting our outreach plans into place so that when it comes time for our next phase, which is counting the population, people are educated and motivated to participate. So we're right on the edge of finishing that second phase of our operation of motivating people to respond, and we're right at the doorstep of getting ready to count people. Um, so April 1st is Census Day, but even in advance of April 1st, information is going to be mailed out to housing units, letting them know that it's time for them to respond. And I'll talk with you a little bit about that timeline here in just a minute. After we count the population, we conduct what we call non-response follow-up. That is where we have census representatives going again um, back out into the communities to follow up with all the housing units that have not yet responded to their census questionnaire. After we conduct non-response follow-up, which will take us to about the end of August, that data, um, the collected data is tabulated and the results of the census data are given to the president um, by December 31st of 2020. And then those counts also go to the states in April of 2021 for redistricting. We also talk about um, different communication phases that we go through as we think about how do we get how do we give information out to um, our local communities and to the people who live here. And we've done this through a, a series and a, a, sep a few separate phases, communication phases. Um, so right now in March, um, we are in what we call our encourage phase. So we're really thinking about um, not only the best ways to get information out to people. Um, which we're actively doing now, but now how do we encourage people to actually participate? So that is the goal and the charge of our Complete Count Committee right now is to think about how we do just that. Um, and, and you can all help um, during this encourage phase as we are working towards um, encouraging those within your communities to respond to the census um, in a number of ways which I'll also talk about. So some of the key messages that we have been using is letting people know that responding to the census is important. Um, it's important for representation, it's important for funding, it's important for families, individuals, and communities. It's safe. Um, we like to talk about how the census is private and confidential. So federal law protects privacy and confidentiality. Not only does it, Title 13 of the US Code governs the work that we do um, at the Census Bureau, but it is also what protects personal responses. So um, the data that's collected through the decennial census cannot be shared with other federal agencies. It can't be shared with immigration enforcement. It can't be shared with local law enforcement, federal law enforcement agencies. It can never be used against you in any way. Um, so when we think about what some of the barriers and challenges are to participating, um, those are things that we have to be mindful of and thinking about is there are, many, there are many people who fear responding to the census because they're not sure how that information is used and how and when it can be shared. And so the short and easy is to let people know 
that their information can never be shared, period. Their information is protected for a lifetime. And at some point in time, the Census Bureau had decided that a lifetime meant 72 years. So if you're somebody who is interested in, in genealogy and you've gone back to use census data um, in that respect, you know that you can access census data, but it isn't up until 72 years after the collection of that data that that information is released and available um, for people to access. Oops, I skipped that one. The other thing that's important for me to talk about is um, we have now made it easier by changing the design and the data collection, we've made it easier for people to participate um, in the census by offering more ways for people to respond. So if you remember census years of the past and you know the only way to respond was you got your hard copy survey in the mail, you filled it out and you mailed it back. So those were the days of the census questionnaires of the past and so now people will be able to respond online by phone using the toll free number um, and you can also still use the paper, the, the, the hard copy paper mail back questionnaire if you would prefer to do that as well. Another addition to, again, encouraging people to respond um, and eliminating some of those barriers is by making more languages support available for individuals. So in all of those 12 languages that you see in bold on the left-hand side, um, you can respond to the census in all of those languages, either online or by phone. In the additional 59 languages that you see, we will have language guides and language support tools available so that people can respond to the census in their preferred language. Sure. Starting from the top, those languages are Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, Polish, French, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Japanese. So starting in March, um, this is just to help you understand the timeline of when people will be invited to respond. The Census Bureau will start mailing out letters, invitation letters to households across the country starting on March 12th. So through the, the period of March 12th through the 20th, you can expect to receive a letter in the mail um, that is inviting you to respond to the census and it will provide some guidance and instruction um, to residents as to how to go about responding. What you also notice is that every week, if you're following this timeline here, um, in this box on the right hand side, every week after that in initial mailing is sent, um, you'll receive a reminder letter. And it isn't until about early to mid-April that if you haven't responded online or by phone, you will automatically be mailed the paper questionnaire. Um, if we, when we get to the end of April, if you have yet to respond to the census, either by mail, or excuse me, online or by phone, you can expect to be put into that non-response follow-up operation, which is where a census taker or a census enumerator will come to your home and help you complete your census questionnaire and count everybody who's living in your household as of April 1st. The other thing I'd like to mention is that um, in addition to counting people in their homes and for those who have permanent housing, we also have special operations for how we count people in group living quarters. So for example, we have a different method and a different operation for counting people who live in nursing homes, college dormitories, prisons and jails, any type of group um, living facility. We also have special operations for how we count people experiencing homelessness. So just because you do not have a permanent residence does not mean you don't get counted in the census. So what we've been doing through our partners, our partnership is identifying locations across our communities where people might be living and sleeping on April 1st if they do not have permanent housing, um, and we will locate them there. So places like shelters and food pantries and various other community-based um, organizations as well. So I'd like to leave you with um, some information about what we, the goals of the Complete Count Committee is, is to really think about what are those hard to count population groups? Who is less likely to respond to the census? Um, we know that we have areas in and around Eau Claire County that have been designated as high, low response areas. So of the 20 different census tracts in Eau Claire County, six of those census tracts have been deemed low response score areas. 
So those are primarily areas in and around our university. Um, we have a couple on the, um, the western, northwestern part of the county in the town of Union. Um, and we also have an area in and around Augusta that has also been designated as a high low response for area. So our complete count committee is looking at those areas and prioritizing those areas in terms of doing some targeted outreach. Um, so I just want you to know that every community across the county is, is going to be outreached to through the outreach efforts and strategies of the complete count committee. And if you live in one of those areas, um, I, I, I'd like to show that to you quickly so that you can sort of visualize. These are those six high LRS areas that I had mentioned to you, um, again, primarily being in and around the downtown and university areas. You see the numbers on here. All of these census tracts have what we call a low response score of 20% or greater, meaning that we anticipate that 20 or more percent of all housing units in those census tracts are not going to respond to the census. So our job through outreach and engagement is to think about how we can encourage people in these particularly low responding census tract areas to respond. So as people begin to respond starting March 1st, we'll be able to track these responses in real time. Um, there will be public facing data maps and tools that we'll be able to monitor where across Eau Claire County do we have low response. And so as we move through the census operations and timeline, we'll be shifting our outreach and making sure that we're doing continued outreach and strategizing in all of those areas that have a low response until we get to 100% response across Eau Claire County. Thank you. Supervisors, if you have a question, please use your keypads. Are there any questions? Supervisor Jansen. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how the count works for incarcerated individuals. Specifically, let's say I have a loved one who normally resides in Eau Claire County, but they're mm -hmm. currently serving in Dodge County. Do they get counted for Dodge County? Good or question. Yep. So um, if you are an incarcerated individual, you get counted where you are living and sleeping. So if the facility is in Eau Claire County, you would be included in the Eau Claire County count. So even though my my loved one is an Eau Claire resident, that potential $1,338 is going to Dodge County and not to Eau Claire yes. County. Thank you. Yes. Supervisor Schneider. I hope in your radio ads you give the 800 number, and I hope it's something catchy like call census because for people who do not read regular print, whether because they're blind or because they have dyslexia or a variety of reasons, uh, if they're getting the information through their ears, it better be catchy so that they can remember to actually do the calling. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point. We haven't, um, those numbers haven't been shared with us as of yet. We do anticipate those numbers will be coming out to us in the next week or so so that we can share them with partners. Um, we've had many of our partners asking for those numbers now so that they can put them online on their websites, using them through social media. Um, I know there has been a lot of um, outreach and work with local media to begin to let people know the site that they go to, um, to respond via the online portal and the numbers to call. But I think you do raise a good point in making sure that the information that reaches people is something that will be um, memorable and a, a way for them to actually access who they need to access to be able to participate in the count. Supervisor Coffey. Thank you. I thought you did a wonderful job presenting. And my question, we have many Hmong families in Wisconsin, and I noticed that there isn't a verbal um, response, a phone response, and there isn't a written. I understand that because of the difference in the clans and the dialects, but is that why they did not, they chose not to have that available? I really don't have a good answer for why, um, but to address that, and I would agree with you, and that has been um, that same concern and issue has been brought up you know, many times as we've been working with um, members of the Hmong community and specifically those who attend and work with the Complete Count Committee, these questions and concerns have been raised. So what we have been doing is starting to brainstorm how can we provide using our own local trusted voices, how can we offer up more support 
for individuals um, of the Hmong community. So whether that be we have locations and times designated where we will set up a mobile response location and we have individuals from the community who are willing to be there on site voluntarily assisting people in filling out their census questionnaire. Um, it also becomes very important when we think about recruiting census workers. So a lot of work has been done to make sure that we're recruiting census takers from all of our communities, from the Hispanic community, from the Hmong community, um, from the Asian American community. So we are, we are really striving to make sure that we are hiring up people with adequate language skills to be able to support people in that capacity. And I hope we can pay them translation um, fees because um, I think often we ask of our neighbors um, to do this and many times these people are of limited income and we're asking them to not only work their 40 hour a week but then do that as a volunteer. So yeah. if, if <coughs> we can find some stipend money to help with um, translation costs, I think that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. We, we did just learn um, that there is, even though Wisconsin did not, we were one of the states that funding was not allocated to doing census um, outreach uh, as a state. We did recently learn that there are small funding pools, um, we just learned about it actually early on Monday, that local partners and local governments can apply for grants of $2,500 and greater to be able to assist them in their outreach and their census support. So that might be an opportunity and I will certainly be sharing that with all of the Eau Claire City County CCC members and partners. Thank you. And that might be an opportunity. You're welcome. Supervisor Bates followed by Supervisor Knight. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we have a lot of individuals, Hispanic individuals working on our dairy farms. Mm -hmm. Um, not all of them are there on a legal basis. Uh, what are we doing to, since we do want to count them, what are we doing to encourage them to be a part of the census and not be worried about uh, if they do participate, the ramifications? No, that's a great question. So again, we look to our trusted voices. That's why our community partnership and engagement program is is so important and it's really integral to the work that we're doing because we're looking to, you know, you mentioned um, maybe large farming or dairy farming, whatever type of farming it may be that employs a lot of migrant farm workers. And so one strategy we've been using is using those, those large farm employers to help us convey to their employees the importance of them responding. Oftentimes those individuals might even be living on their, on the land that is owned by the, by the, um, the farm owner. And so working with them to possibly include those individuals on their own household census response to make sure they get counted, which you can do if those individuals are living on your property and there is not a, a separate designated housing unit for them. Um, so that is one strategy that's being employed to help us think about how do we convey to them that it's important that they count them or that we count them and also giving them opportunities to respond on their own or to be counted through a household questionnaire of an employer whose land they might be living on. Um, we're also using, in, in, you, you talked specifically about migrant farm workers um, and it, possibly the Hispanic community. So we have Hispanic partnership specialists who are also helping us do that type of outreach, that specific type of outreach um, to our, our are different demographic and population groups. So the Hispanic community is one example. Our Hmong community is another example. So we have um, where I am a government partnership specialist and I work primarily with, with local governments, our community-based partnership specialists who often have language skills and are members and part of these other um, population and community groups, they're working to help us educate and engage um, those from other um, groups. Thank you, Supervisor Knight, followed by Supervisor Russell. And I remind the members, please speak directly into your microphone. Yes, um, we've already received at our household a census form. It's <clears throat> pretty thick. It's, it's almost um, worse than doing income taxes. <laughs> um, but one of the first questions it asked is, are you a US citizen? Which didn't bother me that much, but it's bothering person too. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing um, if you got a really census questionnaire, you very likely received the American Community Survey, which is another Census Bureau survey that we conduct on an ongoing basis every month in every community across the country. 
So unlike the census, the decennial census questionnaire, which was only nine questions, and I failed to mention this, my apologies, this year's census includes only nine questions and it's expected to take about 10 minutes to complete. So if you got a really long, um, you know, several pages of a questionnaire, that is likely the American Community Survey, which does ask that question, but the citizenship question um, is not included on the decennial census questionnaire. Okay, how can I convince person two, <coughs> also identified as my current wife, yes. um, <laughs> that she should fill in the blank with um, saying that she is a U.S. citizen and that it won't, it won't she, I think she's doing it kind of in solidarity with these mm -hmm. people we were just talking about who uh, may not be uh, U.S. citizens but may still be living here and working here. Sure. Well, I guess my, my initial um, thought and instinct would be to relay to person two that information provided on any Census Bureau questionnaire is private and confidential. So if her hesitancy to respond would be in not knowing how that information was used or shared, um, letting her, that person to know that that information is private and confidential. No Census Bureau survey, no data would ever be shared or released to identify you as an individual or your household or your business. Um, so hopefully, by, by letting people know that their privacy and confidentiality is protected under federal law, um, that may help to encourage people to respond to all of the questions on the census questionnaire. Okay. Supervisor Russell, followed by Supervisor Dunning. Um, you just answered my question. I wondered if the citizenship question was on the um, census, but it's not, yeah. right? It's not. Thank you. Supervisor Dunning, followed by Supervisor Kronk. Amish population. Oh, great question. So much like um, the question about how do we work with and engage um, our migrant farm, farm workers, we're doing and employing the same strategy for um, making sure that we count everyone in our Amish communities as well. So for example, I've, been, I've received calls from um, many local officials in our Bridge Creek, area, our town of Bridge Creek, um, our town of Fairchild, areas across Eau Claire County where we have larger pockets of Amish community, of Amish individuals. Um, and I had a call the other day from the chairman, or the town chairman, president of um, the town of Fairchild saying he had already talked with, he has a good relationship with the Amish in his community, and he has already talked with them, and they have asked for his help in completing their census questionnaire. They understand why it's important. They understand the value, so there may be some cultural differences, right, that will um, maybe not allow them to participate in the ways that we will be responding, so online or by phone, but finding ways that we can help support and provide assistance for making sure that we count them. So again, similar to how, right, but trust, local trusted voices are really going to matter. So when we have those local trusted voices that already have good and established relationships, with, with bishops or members of the Amish community, that is going to be a really good avenue into making sure that we count everyone. Supervisor Kronk, followed by Supervisor Anton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming and sharing this uh, information. I was curious um, if some of the information was ever sent in Braille. Also, if you, um, what are your hiring practices? Because I know they're hiring everywhere. If people cannot uh, be hired based on a previous felony conviction, and how are you engaging populations um, like Supervisor Jansen's hypothetical loved one who's in Dodge County where that household may understand the money's not coming here anyway, and if I'm somebody who's on felony probation and the money goes towards legislative representation but I can't vote, how are you how are you strategizing those three things? So I'll answer that one quickly. Um, so if you are if you are incarcerated, you will be counted through that group quarters operation and jails and prisons have um, a, a selection of a, a variety of methods that they can use or select from to count everyone that is living in their facility. So it is not like the rest of us who have an opportunity to self-respond and self-report how many people are living in our household, they will automatically be counted through that facility's preferred method. Um, 
So there wouldn't be a question as to whether or not – they couldn't choose to not be counted, if that answers your question there or addresses that anyway. And then your other question was related to hiring practices. And are you talking about just kind of blanketly how are we hiring or what is our process for weeding people out or – I was saying if there's a blanket exclusion for hiring people with felony convictions, and my question wasn't about how people are counted if they're in jail or prison. It was a strategy. How are you strategizing to encourage people to fill out the census if they themselves can't vote? And part of the goal is to have more legislative representation. How is that meaningful to somebody that can't vote? What is your strategy to address that? No, I understand. I'm sorry. That's okay. I understood your question initially. But remember that representation and reapportioning representation is only one piece of the census operation, one piece of this pie. So while an individual may not be able to vote, they are still going to be able to gain from what comes back to the community in other ways through how funding comes back to our community, through things and other programs that they may be recipients of or they may be benefiting from or they may be relying on for improved quality of life. It helps sustain the family. It helps sustain them as an individual. So I think we have to look at what are the other impacts on individuals and how can we make that be a motivator for somebody versus they're not – versus looking at it just from a representation standpoint and looking at how else does it impact an individual and how can we make this not as equal. So that is one strategy that we've been using is really thinking about right here in Eau Claire, what matters to people? What matters to the individuals that you work with? What matters to the population that you serve? So those are the things that we're trying to draw up and highlight those things as we continue to work with those individuals. And there was another question. I just wondered if you – I saw the languages and I know there was a question about the phone number if you were to call in, and I was wondering if there was information sent in Braille. So we will have information in Braille. We will have – I'm trying to think of when and where all of this information will be released. So as soon as we have all of that information, all of those response options available, those – that's part of the outreach strategy of the Complete Count Committee is once people are now able to respond, letting them know all of the options they have for responding. So we'll have materials available in large print. We'll have materials in Braille. We'll have materials in various languages. So – and we'll also be working with community-based organizations and other agencies and nonprofits who also work with individuals who are likely to need assistance or support in a Braille version versus, you know, or another non-English or preferred language. So we will be able to – we'll be working to identify what places around the community do we want to make sure is set up and equipped with the appropriate materials to help people respond in the way that they are able to. Because the goal is to ensure that the census is accessible to everybody. So that is why we've been engaging partners at the local level to make sure that we have adequate support and assistance for – that will enable everyone to participate. And your other question about hiring practices, it's – we are encouraging everybody to apply. So whether or not you would get hired if you were somebody that has a felony, that is, I think, determined on a case-by-case basis. But all Census Bureau employees go through the same hiring process, so the same background check. They get fingerprinted. And who makes it all the way through the application process and who drops out as a result of some of those things, it's really hard to know. But we're not turning people away or discouraging them from applying just because they may have a criminal history. We really are encouraging everyone to apply. You're welcome. Final speaker, Supervisor Anton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Picking up on what Jim Dunning raised as an issue, the Amish population, I live in Augusta. And 10 years ago, I circulated a great deal of my time as a field representative after the written ones had been submitted to talk with people in the Amish area. There was a great deal of reluctance on the part of the women, who were generally the ones who were home, to speak with me unless their husband was there, too. And sometimes they wanted a neighbor or they wanted the bishop. It was 
a case of not being sure that the community would accept the kind of response that they would be giving. And so my real uh, issue there is what could we do with the people who are the leaders in the community, and of course that includes the bishops, but there are some others as well, to bring them into a higher level of understanding so that maybe they'll submit the paperwork. If not, at least when someone shows up, they won't look at you with rolled eyes and say, well, can you come back later when Charlie and whoever else is going to be here? Uh, it, it's not that it can't be done, but um, it seems to me we might be able to overcome that by some uh, action that we take earlier. Yes. What do you suggest we might do there? And I, and I think you raise a good point, and the things that you're suggesting are things that are that are actually happening now. So we have begun starting those conversations and identifying who from the local communities, who has an established relationship already with somebody um, who is seen to be uh, higher up or an acceptable person to be speaking about these things with within the Amish community. So that might be even as, um, and I don't want to simplify it and make it sound simple, but designating a place and time um, where Amish, the individuals from the Amish community can come and have some assistance in filling out their paper questionnaires with somebody from the community that is willing to be there and be present. Um, so offering a place and time for people to actually show up at a, at a designated location to do that, but also thinking about asking the very questions that you're asking. If somebody comes to your door to help you to follow up because you haven't responded, who is the most likely person to elicit a positive interaction from either that community or that individual and that family. So those are the discussions and conversations that are happening right now to identify exactly, and it might be different from community to community. So those those are the critical conversations that are happening right now, and I think it's going to be very unique depending on where we are. Um, so in the city of Augusta, for example, um, those that outreach is, is starting in terms of looking at who who are the trusted voices within the uh, within the Augusta area that can help us engage um, the leaders of the Amish community in that particular area? So those that strategizing is happening. Um, I don't have a, a good sort of blanket answer or or you know kind of a hard and fast strategy that will work for every single community because we've seen that that's not that's not necessarily how it works. Um, what's effective in one community may not be effective in another. So it really is looking and working with those at the local level to help us think about what's going to be most effective and then we start to employ some of those strategies. Um, but I would be happy to follow up with you if um, you'd like to talk more about the, the city of Augusta and the Amish community there. Well, we have a small uh, census committee and I'm chair of that committee so I'd be really interested in Wonderful. talking with you. Thank you. Supervisor Schneider. I'm wondering if somebody is a sign language user and they ignore the piece of paper because they have a pretty low reading level, uh, how would they be contacted? You're wondering if um, this is an individual who uses American Sign Language yes. and receives their letter in the mail and is not able to understand what that letter is conveying? Uh -huh. How would that person know how to respond? How would they be contacted? Because I assume you would sure. seek them out, but you wouldn't know that somebody who's a sign language user is living in that particular household. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So you go knocking on the door and maybe you don't use sign. Mm -hmm. So if if it were a case where that household did not respond to the census questionnaire because they received their letter and perhaps didn't know what it said, um, were not able to uh, read and understand the instructions on how to respond, somebody would be following up with that household during non-response follow-up at that time. If they needed assistance, um, they would be able to ask for that. So that's assuming that they get all the way through the self-response period and they haven't responded, and it happens that now they're in non-response and someone shows up. Um, the other more likely thing that I'm thinking will, will hopefully happen is that through other various um, networks that this person may be involved in, 
they would already be informed and know about places around the community that they could go to for assistance um, and places that they could go to for information about how to respond and actually have some assistance on site. We will have various locations across Eau Claire County that will be set up and designated as mobile response locations. Those, those designated places are being decided now um, between me and our local partners and our Eau Claire Area Census Office. So we will have multiple locations speckled across the county all the way through the end of April to make sure that individuals who have specific needs or requests for support um, will have access to them. Thank you, Ms. Manny. The next item on our agenda, wait for the clerk to come back. Next item on our agenda is under first reading of ordinances and resolutions by members, file 109. Supervisor Lavelle. Yes, sir. I, I, I have an announcement, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Is it relevant to this motion? To no, this resolution? It's under uh, claims, petition, and communications. We went could, by that. Could you, could you wait on that? Okay. I, I'll come back. I promise I'll come back to you. All right. Uh, directing the county administrator to take significant action steps with the Department of Human Services to ensure budget compliance in the year 2020. This is a resolution coming from a member. Uh, ordinarily, the chair will refer this to committee. Um, the chair refers this to a budget and finance, uh, administration, human resources, and human services. Uh, and we will take this up when the report comes back from those committees. And I encourage those committees with all deliberate speed to consider this so that possibly we may address this at the meeting on March the 18th, 17th, excuse me. Okay, all right. The next item on our agenda under Committee on Human Resources is file 108. To repeal and recreate section 3.20.005 of the code, salaries of elected officials, and amending section 3.20.010E of the code, benefits of elected officials. Uh, motion, Supervisor Schneider, second Supervisor Bates, speaking to this for the Committee on Human Resources is Supervisor Gatlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I need to offer a amendment to this ordinance. The amendment, I would defer to Mr. Sullivan. It's gonna explain the amendment. Speaking to the microphone. Mr. Sullivan's gonna explain the amendment. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the clerk has pointed out we need a second in order to proceed with this. Did second. You, somebody seconded over there. Or, we had a second. Yeah, supervisor. I'm sorry. The Thank you. The initial Super one, but she's offering the amendment. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't spring it, please. Oh. Uh, so you're, you're offering the amendment. What we need is a second okay, for the I amendment, understand. and then we'll yep. proceed with it. Second, Supervisor Schneider. Uh, Corp Counsel Sullivan, please proceed. Um, the reason that you have an amendment before you. Okay, it's not on. It's not oh. on. No, it's Can you hear me now? Better. Okay. Speak loudly. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the reason that we needed to offer this amendment is to create, correct some of the language in this ordinance uh, to accomplish its purpose. Uh, the purpose of this uh, ordinance is to update uh, the salaries of the county clerk, the county treasurer, and the register of deeds. Back in March of 2018, uh, we did update this section of the code, section 3.20.005. And at that time, uh, the salaries for the county clerk, the treasurer, and the register of deeds were updated through the year 2020, so ending this year. We also at that time updated the salaries of the clerk of court and the sheriff through 2021 and 2022. And so <clears throat> this amendment or this uh, ordinance is being offered to 
update uh, the salaries of the county clerk, the county treasurer, and the register of deeds for the year 2021 through 2024. And the reason we're doing it that way is because of the election cycles of the various elected officials. Um, the amendments that you have in front of you, um, when this ordinance was prepared, <clears throat> largely copied the old ordinance that was done in 2018. And that uh, document talked about repealing and recreating section 3.20.005. Um, so just going through uh, the proposed amendments, um, what the first one is, is on page one, line four and five. What we would uh, do first of all is ask that uh, amending section 3.20.010E of the code benefits of elected officials, officials be stricken from uh, the heading of this uh, particular ordinance. Back in 2018, that was part of the ordinance. It is not uh, being dealt with this with this particular one in file number 108. Um, then on uh, lines 9 and 10, uh, right now it reads uh, section 3.20.005 of the code be repealed and recreated to read and then the ordinance follows that. If it were to continue to read, repealed and recreated to, to read, what would happen effect, effectively there is, is that we would delete the salaries for uh, the county sheriff and the clerk of court for the years uh, 2021 and 2022, which the county board has already adopted. And so uh, the amendment is, is to substitute there the word amend uh, to read be amended to read. Um, and then um, three, four, and five of the amendments are essentially changing the numbers in section E from four, five, and six to one, two, and three. Um, and that would be the salaries for the year 2024. There is one further amendment that I uh, just noticed that probably should go into this. And I would ask uh, if Supervisor Gatlin, she may need to uh, request to amend her amendment. Um, in the heading, the very first line, in, in line number three, it says to repeal and create, that actually should read to amend section 3.20.005. And so um, that's essentially what's being done here through this amendment is correcting the language so that it accomplishes the purpose of amending the salaries of the county clerk, the county treasurer, and the register of deeds for the years 2021 through 2024. Just to be clear, uh, Supervisor Gatlin, do you make that amendment to amend the amendment? Yes, I do. Okay, we have a second for that amendment to the amendment. Supervisor <clears throat> Schneider, thank you. Let's do this in order. So we're voting right now on the amendment of the amendment. Please take your keypads in hand and indicate your vote. Supervisor Schneider. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It, technically, yes, but I think the, that without objection, go ahead. Without objection, go ahead. We would. No, no, you're striking the language in the heading so that the heading would now read to amend section 3.20.005 of the code salaries of elected officials, period. Anything following that in the heading would be deleted, amending section 3.20. Point zero one zero e of the code benefits of elected officials that would be deleted because this ordinance is not dealing with that that was copied from the ordinance that it went through in 2018 it should not have been included and so and the reason it shouldn't be included is because it doesn't include the clerk of courts and the sheriff in this particular right. change and in 
by way of history, when I look at the uh, ordinance that was adopted back in 2018, uh, 3.20.010 came into effect because at that time the board uh, gave the sheriff, sheriff a reimbursement of up to $720 annually for expenses incurred for the purchase of uniforms based on uh, receipts okay. reserved received at monthly expense reports. So that was the difference. We're not doing that this time, so that that part of the heading should be deleted or stricken. And primarily because it does not include the sheriff and the clerk of court. Correct. Thank you. That's all I needed to know. Thank okay. you so much. No problem. This is a bit irregular, but we're going to vote again. Unanimous. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, never mind. We just voted. <laughs> we are now back to the amendment as amended. Uh, that is the uh, amendment that you have in front of you as amended by our previous action. Uh, please take your keypads in hand and indicate your vote on the um, amended amendment. Supervisor, Supervisor Schneider. Well, at this point, does she just need to hit confirm or does she need yes. to? Yes, yes. Well, it's being stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> There it goes. There, there it goes. goes, Janet. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. It is unanimous. We are back to the main motion. As amended, as amended and amended, we are back to the main motion. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote. Thank what you. What are we voting on? Wait, yeah, there's discussion. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, we already voted on both of them. So I'm sorry, Supervisor Gatlin. I ran over you there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we can just give this to him and not talk about it. But that wouldn't be right. So the. These three positions are three of the five elected positions, and this, this, these three are elected for a four-year term. So the salary has to attach to the position before an election. So these, these positions are required to work as a department director. They attend director meetings, supervise, and evaluate employees, and make skills-based decisions. The, the positions are a specialty trade, and the employee in the position is also required to work the front line and interact with county clients in daily operations as needed. So the three members present at the HR committee reviewed the salaries of these elected positions in five other counties with similar de demographics as Eau Claire and felt this increase presented was fair and shows that Eau Claire County values the elective employees who are successful in their responsibilities. The current elected officials in these three positions offer Eau Claire County invaluable experience, which comes from length of service. With a fair increase in salary, they may consider to continue to put their name on the ballot, which would be a win for everybody. So I support this increase in salaries for the next four years. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Lavelle, do you have a question regarding this? I'd like to speak to this. To Thank this you. motion. Yeah, yes, please. Sir. Go ahead. I got something else, too. I'll do it at the end. It's yeah, under I know. communication. That's okay. Over the years, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Over the years, I probably already vo always voted for this, but at this time I looked at it, and I'm looking without the collective bargaining unit here anymore. Uh, when they used to give these elected official raises, uh, the union went, say, okay, you're giving elected official raises, give us our people you know, raise justifiable to that. And right now, the correct me if I'm wrong, I think that the workers right now are get a one plus one percent raise a year. Is that correct? Uh, Minister Rishaf? The, um, they get the step increase, but then they also get the cost of living. Which is one percent. Which is one percent. And so depending on where they're at on the steps, they actually receive anywhere between a two or three percent increase year over year. 
They get, always get at least two? Yes. Well, I, I guess I heard wrong because I heard that they get a one for cost of living and a one one percent for step increase is what and I was. That would be yes, and the, the combination is that two percent. Okay, two percent. So it's mm -hmm. one one 2%, plus one equals two percent. Two anywhere between two and three percent, correct? I guess you. I don't follow you, but uh, I'm going to vote against this because I, I've got nothing against the elected officials, and I think they're doing a good job. But I see the people that are on the bottom of the list. When you go for an hourly rate, they'll probably get a, a 40 cent increase, and the elected officials will get a two two dollar two dollar twenty five cent increase. And uh, uh, I think that's wrong. I think uh, it doesn't send a good uh, message to the employees that uh, these people are getting that kind of raise. And I talked to a few people that work here and I talked to some department heads, I won't mention any names. And I talked to, I come from, you know, uh, uh, we didn't know we were a 14.5% poverty rate in Eau Claire County. Uh, we don't have a lot of high paying, we do have high paying jobs, we don't have a lot. And we got a lot of people that are homeless. And I look at the people I represent in my district and I talked to a few of them on the street today because I have a lot of street traffic going by in the last few days. And I asked him what they, I said, you people make this, I told him what the salaries were. And I asked him what kind of money. One person said that's more they, than they made in two years. Another person said, if we combine both our salaries, that's about $20,000 less than we make. So I'm, I'm speaking for the people I represent, okay? And that's one of, the, and one of the reasons I brought this up. So I can't in good conscience back a 6% Plus a three percent, three percent, three percent raise. I just I can't vote for it. It'll probably go through, but I'm just stating my, the, what how I feel about it. And again, I say nothing against the elected officials. I think they're doing a good job. And one question I have: if say if one of your elected officials uh, retired, and you elected, uh, for example, a county clerk in the final year, so somebody would come in and start out at eighty-five thousand dollars, would that be correct? So they would actually obtain the salary that yeah, was okay. set for so, that year, so yes. Some, so, so a new person could come in and start to pay at $85,000. And you look around the city here and how many could start and get a, a, a payment of uh, $85,000 as a new person. And then the person asked me oh, one more thing. They asked me, oh, well, what do you county supervisors make? And I told them, I said, well, we got to raise uh, three, four years ago. We got five dollars a meeting more but they discontinued the meetings so they took care of that five dollars more than we had and I said uh, coming up in April and that's probably why we got so many contested races that we're going to go from 110.50 salary up to 120 a nine dollar and fifty cent raise so I can see why so many people are running for this job <laughs> so uh, I can understand that so I just I just told them what we actually made and what we're going to get, but to give the people a reminder that uh, nine dollar and fifty cent raise that we're getting was something that we gave up, I think, it back in 1999. So that's not really a raise; it's just something that we uh, didn't get for the last 20 years. So, so I, uh, I said nothing against the elected officials, but I can, in good conscience, vote for this. Thank you, Supervisor Pagonis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to support this. Um, I think that as we look at the other counties that are listed in the fact sheet, um, the increases are commensurate. Um, in the fact sheet, even for 2020, it shows that Eau Claire, Eau Claire is the lowest, Fond du Lac a close second, but each of the other counties are substantially higher, especially La Crosse County. The point is we want people to run for these positions who know what they're doing. The, our, our, I know that the clerk of courts is not on here, but the last clerk of court race was very contested to individuals, to senior individuals in the clerk of courts. It's very important that people wanna take on these jobs. These are hard jobs. Um, the jobs that are listed here, the positions listed here, the county clerk, the county treasurer, and the register of deeds, 
these are all working positions. These are not individuals who don't have have the day job. They have nine to five job, eight to five jobs along with everyone else in the courthouse. And there's an expectation that they're going to run their offices efficiently. And I think that we need to have a compensation that will match the responsibility to the position. So I support this. Um, I think it's reasonable. Um, Eau Claire is, um, as Supervisor Gatlin said, Eau Claire is notoriously a low pay uh, county. And I think this just would give encouragement to individuals, um, not that I want the current individuals to have opponents, but give encouragement to individuals to actually run for these positions. So I, I support this and I think that we should um, all consider supporting it because it's, these are reasonable wages. Thank you. The chair is gonna take this opportunity to introduce you to the two individuals who are the subject or the object of this motion. Our treasurer, Glenda Lyons, would you please stand up? Who thinks that many people don't know who she is, so <laughs> this is Glenda Lyons, and next to her is her assistant, Tina Pomier. She's the registered deed. Uh, registered deed, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I just changed your job, to, <laughs> sorry. Register of deeds, thank you. Oh, Madam Clerk. <laughs> How could I forget Madam Clerk? I'd fall apart if she weren't sitting here. Thank you. Um, you could stand up too. <laughs> I think everyone knows you. <laughs> okay. Um, Supervisor Gatlin, did you wish to make yes, a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. When a position becomes vacant or a position needs to be reclassed or elected positions need salary increases, it's important that it's not the person in the position. It's really, really important to remember, it is the position. The position has changed, the responsibilities have changed. I know that's really hard to do, especially in this situation when we have, you know, superb elected officials that, like I said, they're superb because they have length of service. And, and as uh, Supervisor Pagona said, they, they work the front lines as well as play um, department manager too. So you can see on the bottom of the fact sheet where the salaries of the other department managers having the same responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other requests to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand. And, and uh, I vote on file 108. Uh, 24 to 2. 24, yes to no. The motion passes. The next item on our agenda comes from the Committee on Judiciary and Law Enforcement, file 85. Command section 9.70.001 of the code, declaration of policy, and to amend section 9.70.005D of the code, definitions. Uh, motion. Supervisor Pagona, second Supervisor Kronk. Speaking to this motion, this uh, file is uh, Supervisor Wilkie. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. Did I misunderstand? <laughs> well, I, my intention, uh, my intent is to uh, first uh, let the board know that uh, the committee did vote four zero in favor of. Um, I was absent from the meeting, but even more importantly, I'd like to defer uh, comments to uh, this uh, ordinance before you to the author and also member of Judiciary and Law, uh, Supervisor Roberts, I think would be the most appropriate person to speak to it. Supervisor Roberts. Okay. Um, I worked with a human rights campaign in Washington, D.C. to develop this language. Um, it stems from uh, some research that came up um, from 2007 to 2016, 48 .2, uh, the elderly population saw a 48.2% increase in homelessness. Um, one in five trans identifying uh, people have faced housing discrimination and veterans have uh, abnormally high homelessness rate as well with uh, the fastest growing subsection actually being um, female veterans. So each of these categories that we're adding as protected statuses 
were targeted um, to fix those those specific problems. Thank you. I see no other requests to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 85. Supervisor Ken, okay. Uh, it, the vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda comes from the Committee on Planning and Development, File 79. To create Chapter 12.74 relating to approval of broadband network projects. Motion, Supervisor Leary. Second, Supervisor Henning. Uh, Supervisor Gibson. All right. Thank you, Chairman Schleyer. Um, this was brought to Planning and Development committee and uh, we all looked at this and the benefits to the whole entire community you know whether it be your the economy and schools et excuse me supervisor thought, Gibson would you speak right into your microphone please we thought this would be a huge benefit to Eau Claire County so we supported it five to zero but I am actually going to refer this for more explanation to supervisor Mallory as I think he was pretty much involved through the whole process Thank you, Supervisor Maori. <clears throat> I, I, I would just like to share that uh, two years ago when I was first running for supervisor position, um, I got an earful of comments from people who live in rural areas that are unserved or underserved about broadband. Um, I heard from town clerks saying, well, we did have a family that was going to move in and build a new home, but they found out there was a lack of internet, high-speed internet. They canceled their plans. Uh, a lot of people say I could telecommute if I had high-speed internet, but I don't, so I have to drive into the office. Um, I've also attended telehealth conferences, and that's an up-and-coming thing where people could stay at home and get health care. Um, and if you look at your handouts on your desk today, we have an unusually large number of them, there's a rural challenge. Um, and counties that have extended broadband to all residents, including the rural areas, have noticed an increase, as Supervisor Gibson mentioned, um, in economic development. Um, education levels go up. Um, people have more value to their homes. It, it helps the whole economy. Uh, and I would just encourage you to consider supporting this because this is a criteria that's part of the state broadband grant. They do look at the actions taken by a city, village, town, or county in support of the grant application that have not been discussed um, in the context of any partnership, and that includes certification as a broadband forward community or telecommuter forward community, and we are working as a, a broadband committee to encourage all the towns to pass the telecommuter forward, uh, and five towns have so far, and we're working towards being able to apply for one or more projects to extend high-speed internet to rural parts of our community, again, that are unserved or underserved. And um, that I think the uh, schedule is similar to last year. Probably the grants will be due sometime in December. Um, and we, we want to be well prepared to submit one or more projects to uh, benefit the citizens of our county. Thank you. I see no request to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 79. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, next is file 98. Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Pleasant Valley. Motion, Supervisor Dunning, second Supervisor Lavelle. Speaking to this uh, file is uh, Supervisor Gibson, correct? Thank you, Chairman Schmeier. Um This is to rezone 19 acres from the A3 agriculture to the A2 agriculture residential. Um, this was recommended by our planning staff, planning development staff, um, to support this. It does meet the town and the county's comprehensive plans as laid out for those areas. 
the uh, Pleasant Valley uh, Township, they voted unanimously to support this and approve it. And this was, uh, we held our, our public hearing at the Planning and Development Committee and we supported this uh, five zero. So I'd recommend supporting this also. Thank you. I see no request to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 98. Supervisor Bates has left. Supervisor Stelchus. Sorry to wake you up there. <laughs> and Supervisor Sorry. Gatlin, just confirm. Supervisor Gatlin, can you confirm? <laughs> it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one announcement, I believe, from Supervisor Lavelle. Oh, excuse me. Was it relevant to our last action? Is this an announcement of some kind? I'm going to ask Supervisor Lavelle made a request, then I'll come to you. Okay. And you have one also. Okay. Supervisor Lavelle. Okay. For those of you who remember Dave Donovan, we're on the board when Dave Donovan was here. Uh, uh, it's Julie Tooney. She's on the Chippewa Valley Business Innovation uh, Board of Directors with me. Dave was on there and he, he uh, developed cancer. He went back to uh, Madison to be closer to his family. He was he was transferred to Madison at, when he was on the board and he went down there. I just got an email from her now that Dave sent to her and it's gonna almost make you cry. And his time is short, so I just wanted the people that knew he was, he was a good guy. Dave Donham was a very good man, so. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor DeLuca. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, let everyone know coming up next Saturday, March 14th, is Beaver Creek Reserve's most longest running event, French Toast Breakfast. Um, it has activities for all ages, and you can um, do multiple things across the entire campus. Um, Supervisor Maori and I have tickets this evening available if you would like to purchase. $7 for adults, and if uh, you have children 2 to 12, it's $4. And if you want to buy them at the door, they're more expensive. So, um, But uh, it's a really great time. They're going to have some special bird banding at the Citizen Science Center. If the weather permits, they'll do some maple syruping. Um, there is an annual Chippewa Valley watercolor exhibit, and uh, there will be an open house at the Hobbs Observatory with the Chippewa Valley uh, Astronomical Society. Plus, they have tons of crafts and activities for the kids, so come and join us and buy some tickets from us. Thank you. Supervisor Maori. Yes, I want to thank everyone for their support of the Broadband Forward uh, resolution. And just wanted to mention that um, one of the county employees, Rod Esslinger, who's uh, you know, on the committee as staff, has developed an excellent survey. You should have received an email to that effect. But it's tied into GIS, so it'll, um, if you put in your, your speed, there's a test that you can take um, and, and put in your speed, both download and upload, and put in your address it'll go immediately into a map. And that's an important piece of this because the BSC has maps, but they're uh, very inaccurate. And they're based, based on census data, tying to our speaker tonight. So if they serve one resident in a census track and it's high speed, they can count the whole track as being served. And we have to be able to, to uh, show that that's not the case, that we have unserved and underserved areas of the county, and this will generate the map for us. So please, unlike the census, unlike elections, take it often, you know, because sometimes <laughs> you might, <laughs> don't vote once, vote many times, because you might find that you get home at five o'clock and the speed is way down if you're on a satellite system, they might, they might throttle down the, um, the speed at which you can get upload and download. 
So take it once, take it often, and uh, we'll tabulate the results, and it'll help us for the, with our grant application to the state. And tell your friends? Yes, tell I everyone to take it many times. I think I, I think I speak on behalf of the board, and thank you for all the work that you've done on the broadband project. Thank you. Uh, supervisors, we have reached the end of our meeting. We are adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54702-5148. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715.